that we would be able to have baptisms on Easter Sunday this year. What a great time to celebrate um, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what a great time to celebrate baptism as we do this in this moment. This one's a little bit unusual. It's a little different than what we normally do because first we're going to receive one and we need to affirm one who's requesting baptism, who's not been able to be with us in a worship service. But then we're going to have a bilingual baptism. Well, that is I'm going to be speaking to this person in Spanish and you're just going to have to pretend you understand uh, as we do that. But this is an exciting, exciting moment for us. Lenise, come on down here, please. This is Lenise Broom. And Lenise came to me last year sometime. Was it September, October? Somewhere around there. And we discussed the important things of, of God. And this included her walk with the Lord Jesus and her understanding of who Jesus was in her life. Long story short, after two or three or four different times that we spoke together, Lenise decided that she wanted to give her heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And she did there in my office. And we had the witness, David and I together, uh, in that moment, we had the witness of the joy of the Lord coming upon her and the tears, you know, all the fun stuff that happens when, when you meet the Lord. And it was great. It was an exciting moment. So she's coming to us. And I wonder if you would affirm her as she stands here requesting baptism this morning. We'll fill her paperwork out after church today sometime. But I'd like for us to do that. Would you do that, please? You can applaud. Thank you. You go ahead over here. It's going to go down. Don't worry. Lenise, <clears throat> the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you'll be saved. Who's your Lord? Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in Christ, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Javier. And you know Javier, and you've met him, and Javier Parada is from Venezuela, and um, you pray for him. We're working on the process of him coming into the country as a permanent resident on, in a legal fashion, and, and so that's a lot of paperwork. Y'all know what it's like. But um, Javier comes this morning, and you also know that he sat with me in my office and he told me this was really neat as we talked about his commitment to the Lord. He says, I want, he said, I have believed in the Lord for a number of years now, but I've never found a church that taught exactly what I believed till I came here. And he said, I want to be a part of this fellowship. I want this to be my church home. I want to tell folks that Jesus Christ is my Lord too. So, Javier. Dice la palabra de Dios, Javier, si confesares con tu boca que Jesús es Señor y creyeres en tu corazón que Dios lo levantó de los muertos, serás salvo. Javier, ¿quién es tu Señor? Jesucristo. Amén. Y de acuerdo con tu profesión de fe, yo te bautizo en el nombre del Padre y del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo. Amen. Amen. 
Well, let me say something to you while Nick steps up to the front here and, and the ushers come this way for a moment. Let me say something to you. I don't mind getting wet two or three times in a day, all right? I started this day with a shower. I'm in this water now. I'll finish this day in the water again if you'll make that commitment to Christ today that you, if you've not yet made it. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. This morning, I cannot say anything richer, anything more comforting, anything more significant than this. Jesus Christ has risen, and He is Lord. Amen? Everything in this universe hinges on that truth. Now, the second most important thing that I can say to you this morning is found in verse 8 of what I just read in Luke 24. They remembered his words. Let me ask you a question this morning. Do you remember those words of Jesus that he has spoken to you? Some of you, he spoke to you one promise and some another promise, but he calls you today to remember his words. The greatest words he spoke to you said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you remember that in your life? Do you remember that in your heart right now? I want you to know something. The cross is beautiful and I love, I appreciate uh, everything we sang this morning about the cross and the choir special and, and all that we've celebrated, beginning with, with the resurrection song that I uh, sang uh, fairly well, running back to my office to change clothes to come back after the baptism. Oh man, I just wanted to stand there and have a spell, but I knew I need to hurry. From there on, everything we've said is important. The cross is important, but the cross means nothing without the risen Savior, without the resurrection. And so I'm going to tell you very quickly why I am thankful for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Most of our morning we're going to spend in Ephesians, so you can just flip over there if you want to follow some verses in Ephesians beginning in chapter 1, and we're going to see why I am thankful and why you should be thankful for the resurrection of Jesus Christ this morning. The first thing I want to tell you about is pardon. I'm thankful for the resurrection of Jesus Christ because of the pardon that Jesus gives to me. Uh, how many of you have heard of Shanine Denise Allen? You ever heard of that woman? I didn't think so. I had not heard of her until this past week myself. Let me tell you about her. She got into a little bit of trouble up in New Jersey. She's not from New Jersey. She's from Philadelphia. But you can leave Philadelphia and go to New Jersey in just a, a, a short few minutes. It's not that far of a drive. She got into trouble up there. And she was found guilty of crimes against that state. This past week, however, she received the following in the mail from the state of New Jersey. 
This is from the governor's desk. I, Chris Christie, governor of the state of New Jersey, by virtue of the authority conferred upon me by the Constitution of the state of New Jersey and the statutes of the state, do hereby grant Shanine Denise Allen a full, a free pardon for all criminal charges and indictments arising from the arrest occurring October 1st, 2013, to include the aforesaid crimes. Now, Mrs. Allen did not commit any egregious sin. She didn't murder anyone. She didn't rob any banks. She didn't kidnap anyone. She didn't sell her children into some kind of sex slavery. But she was guilty, and she was pardoned. May I tell you something, ladies and gentlemen? You were guilty. I was guilty. But when we come to Christ, because of the resurrection, we can receive pardon, we can receive forgiveness, full and free by what Jesus did. Sean reminded me this past week, and it was a really great statement, that our sin debt began with the tree, with Adam and Eve in the garden, and our debt was canceled by the death of Christ on a tree. Isn't that wonderful? That's such a profound, deep thought. And um, why I put that out on the Twitter, Twitter sphere, and, and I put that everywhere I could think of, and, and uh, wanted to share it with you now. And, and it's just a powerful, deep thought, a good thought. Why do we need that? Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Because the judgment against your sin is death. Whether you think so or not, it is death. He that believes not is condemned already. Judgment's already been passed. If you have not, by an act of your own faith, turned from sin and turned to the Lord Jesus Christ, you need a pardon this morning. You need a pardon. If you've never trusted Christ, I'm telling you, you need a pardon this morning. I needed a pardon I needed a full pardon, I needed a free pardon, because there's no way I could ever pay the debt that I was incurring against the Lord God. No way. And the Lord God can pardon us just because Jesus died for us. It tells us in Ephesians 1, 7 that in Jesus Christ we have redemption, ladies and gentlemen. Isn't that a precious thought that we have full and free pardon. We have a full and free redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Didn't earn it, can't earn it. We have a pardon. Not only do we have a pardon, we have a position, ladies and gentlemen. In verse 11 of Ephesians 1, it tells us that we have obtained an inheritance. That's what he says to us. Why, that's some of the most wonderful words I can tell you right now, even though it may not sound like it. You just think of it for a few moments. If you're sitting there at your house, and one day some uh, hilariously rich person like Bill Gates or, or, or some of Warren Buffett or some of those other fellows says, sends you a notice and says, you are, you are, my only living relative, we have discovered this, and you inherit what I have. Why, you'd just be beside yourself. You'd start adding it up, everything you could do with $42 billion, wouldn't you? I already have, and I'm just talking about y'all. <laughs> you know, that's a wonderful thought. That's an exciting thing. In Christ Jesus, you have an inheritance. Why? Because you're his son. You're his daughter. That's what scripture teaches us in this moment, uh, each one of us. You see, you have a position with Christ Jesus. In chapter 2 and verse 6, we discover that we have been raised up and we've been made to sit in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. We have a position. You know where it is? It's at the right hand of God the Father. There we are right now, seated in Christ Jesus. Wes, you're not here, son. You're in heaven right now. And we're all glad that your body's here, but you're there too. Listen to me. It's an exciting thing. Everybody here that knows Jesus Christ is in Christ right now, present tense, with the Lord. 
every one of us, we have a position. We have a position as a son. We have a position as a soldier. Second Timothy tells us uh, that, that uh, we should endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And we have a position as a saint. Now some of you may not act too saintly sometimes, but I'm telling you, if you know Christ Jesus... If you know him, if you're born again, if you've repented of your sin, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, God looked at you and says, I now declare you to be a saint. Amen. You're separated for the purpose of God. And that's what God says to us over and over and over. You'll read it in, in, in Romans. You'll read it in Corinthians. You'll read it in Galatians. You'll read it in Ephesians. You'll read it in Colossians. You'll read it in Philippians. You'll read it over and over and over again. Called to be saints. Every single one of us, that's what God has said about us. We have a position. Not only do we have a pardon and a position, we have peace with God. We have peace. The Bible tells us in Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's a rich thing for you to have. But look at Ephesians 2, 14. Would you look at that for just a moment? In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14, the Bible tells us this about the Lord Jesus Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in, create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Ladies and gentlemen, God has broken down all the barriers. There are no barriers. We are one in Christ Jesus, and we have peace in the Lord God. We have peace with God because, ladies and gentlemen, before you know God, I don't care how good you are, I don't care how kind you are, I don't care how generous you are, until you repent and believe on the Lord Jesus and by an act of your own faith and your own will, turn your life over to Him. Until you do that, ladies and gentlemen, you are God's enemy. As pretty as you may be, as kind as you may be, as gentle as you may be, God says, oh, you're my enemy. And you say, I don't like that. I don't care. It's God's truth. You better start liking it. Because that's what God says about you. And you better get on the right team, amen? Because there are folks that are out there that are on the wrong team right now. And you need to repent and you need to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and have peace with God so you can have the peace of God and you can have peace with one another which is the unity that's built in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have pardon, we have position, we have peace and we have power. Back in Ephesians 1.19, a verse that I've used uh, multiple times as I've been referring to the power of God, he tells us that he's praying that we might understand that power, that, that, uh, uh, oh, that super abundant power that, that is ours, that God has offered to everyone through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, you have resurrection power. What does that mean for you when you have resurrection power? It means that you can live in victory, ladies and gentlemen. You don't have to be defeated by sin in your life. Because when you met Jesus Christ and you became a new creation in Christ Jesus, sin lost its hold on you. All it can do now is stand over at the side and holler at you and tell you to do what it says. It no longer has power over your life when you know Jesus Christ. You can have victory because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You don't have to feel like a victim anymore to what those things are that come against you where you may say in your mind, in your heart, I just can't help it. I just, I'm just overcome by these things. You don't have to anymore. You can have victory and you can overcome vices that might come in your life. You have the power, ladies and gentlemen, to walk as Jesus walked. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6, He that says he abides in him must walk even as he also walked. That's how you're supposed to walk. If you want to know 
whether you're wa uh, right with God right now, just take a look at your walk and see, compare it with what you, Jesus does. And if you're walking as Christ walked, ladies and gentlemen, then you can pretty much understand whether you're right with God or not. But if you're not walking as Christ Jesus walked, if your lifestyle doesn't match up to the lifestyle of Jesus Christ, then there's some problems in your life and you need to check yourself out and you need to start looking through your life and see what it is that needs to be removed. But not only that, you have the power to witness. The Bible says in Acts 1.8 that you will receive power after the Holy Spirit's come upon you and you will be my witnesses. The natural consequence of the presence of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, of the resurrection power, is the ability and even desire to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you have no desire this morning to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, then ladies and gentlemen, part of your difficulty is the fact you're not walking in the power of the Lord God. Hello? That's just a real, simple, basic Christianity 101 truth. Ladies and gentlemen, we have power. We have pardon, we have peace, we have power. Oh, I love this. We have purpose. We have purpose. Ephesians 4, 1 says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. You see, not only do we live in victory, we have a vocation. God has given us a purpose. Before someone meets Jesus Christ, their purpose may be focused on what goes on in this world. But when you meet the Lord Jesus Christ, your life changes. And he gives you a holy purpose. And he gives you an eternal purpose. And he makes you feel the, the sense of being valued by God and part of God's army and part of God's family. He gives you purpose. You have a calling. You matter in the body of Christ. You've been given spiritual gifts, ladies and gentlemen. You are important in the body. Every single part of the body is important. Every part. It's all there for a reason. And you are there to be that. You know, those with the gift of mercy and the gift of helps, they're the heart of the church. They're the ones that help us to feel compassion for folks like myself that might say, well, you know, that's your problem. I don't care, you know. And uh, they're the ones that come back and say, no, 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 no. Listen for a minute. And they are the heart of the church. And then you've got You've got the teachers, which are the, the mouth of, of the church, the spokespeople of the church. And you have feet, those that have a passion and are on fire, and so on and so forth. We have all of these spiritual gifts in the church that we're supposed to be exercising, each one of us. And that's the purpose that God has given to us. I'm just delighted the moment I received Christ uh, that God began working into me spiritual gifts that he desired for me to have. And he did the same thing for you at that moment. He may not have revealed all of those spiritual gifts to you yet, but I promise you that they are there. So you have pardon and you have position and you have peace and you have power and you have purpose in your life. But you also have this. You have perseverance. I'm thankful for the resurrection of Jesus because of the perseverance. In Ephesians chapter 6, he tells us this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. What a, what a, a, uh, uh, a precious verse, but can I give you a literal rendering of this verse of scripture? Uh, in, in, a, in an English, it doesn't sound very, very smooth to our ears, but this is more accurate to what it's saying. Finally, my brethren, keep on being strong in the power of his might.
And so you see, this is what God's saying to you. It's a perseverance that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you can keep on being strong in the power of his might. And you can stand for Christ Jesus. This, those words announce to you your perseverance. You know why you can do it? Philippians chapter 2 verses 12 and 13 tell us this beautiful passage of scripture and beautiful words that God has said therefore my beloved as you have always obeyed not as in my presence only but now much more in my absence work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure God says you just keep working it out He's not talking about working for your salvation. He's talking about you bringing to a logical conclusion the salvation that he's given to you. It's kind of like Dr. Lamon is working a math problem. And that's what the word is referring to there. And you work through that thing until you get to the logical conclusion. Sometimes our lives look more like complicated algebraic uh, equations rather than a math problem. We'd love for our life to look like 2 plus 2 equals 4. But Ronnie, it ain't that way, brother. I mean, our lives get complicated sometimes, just like trigonometry and calculus. And Dr. Lamb is back there saying, that's easy for me. I don't know what you're talking about. And so, folks, listen to me. Your life can be that way, and you've got to work out the logical conclusion of walking with Christ Jesus. You can do that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's perseverance, ladies and gentlemen. So you have pardon and you have a position and you have peace and you have power and you have purpose and you have a perseverance all because of the resurrection. But let me tell you, you also have a place. You have a place. Look over at John 14, would you? Turn back a few pages. Verse 1, the Lord says this. John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Wow. We got a place. This world's not my home. I'm a pilgrim here. Although I have a legal citizenship in the United States of America, my home is in heaven with Christ Jesus. That's what he teaches us. I have a place with Jesus Christ. Now the truth of the matter is this. Listen to me. Everybody present here has an eternal place. Everyone. We all do. I don't care what you've done with Christ Jesus today. Everybody present has an eternal place. You say, preacher, you saying we all going to heaven? Nope. I'm saying everybody here got a, an eternal place. If you repent and believe the gospel, you have a place with Christ in heaven. But if you do not repent and do not believe the gospel, and do not believe the resurrection of Jesus, if you do not believe this, then your place is in hell. A place that was prepared for the devil and his angels. So you have a place. Some people think when they die, that's it. It's over. Okay. That's it. I watched, y'all remember the movie Cast Away? Y'all remember that movie back from 2000? 15 years old. Can you believe it's that old now? Wow. 
I was watching that show the other day and, and there's one scene in it where one of the pilots washes up on shore and he digs a, he digs a grave for him with a piece of wood and, and he sticks the body in the ground and you know and I'm thinking, what are they going to do with this scene? There's such a spiritual application that can take place here. And he throws the dirt on it and he says, okay, that's that. And he turns around and walks, oh, walks away. But that's how a lot of people feel. You're dead and it's over. Oh no, it's just beginning. It's just beginning. Amen. And if you know Christ, the joy and the peace and the position, all of these things, oh, how delightful they are. But if you don't know Christ, oh, the suffering and the horror and the hatred and the torment. You see, by faith in Christ Jesus' death for my sins and by faith in his resurrection and declaring him to be Lord, my place is with Jesus. Where's yours? I want to tell you about a man named Louis Jordan. 37-year-old man. Back in January, after months and months and months of working on his own sailboat, single mass sailboat, and fixing that thing up and learning how to sail, going up and down the intracoastal waterways uh, of, of uh, outside of Charleston, South Carolina, Mr. Jordan decided to sail out into the deep, wide Atlantic Ocean. And he got out. And he got into some trouble and disappeared from sight. And there was no communication with him. Nobody could find him. Nobody could hear from him. Mr. Jordan was gone. And his parents and the rest of his family were persuaded the worst has happened. He's lost. He's dead. Well, he was lost. He was lost at sea. And for 66 days, this man was lost at sea. And if you've ever been out on the ocean, maybe on a cruise ship or whatever, you look as far as you can that way, and as far as you can that way, and you run to the stern and look as far as you can that way, and you run to the bow and look as far as you can that way, and all you see is water. There's nothing there. Now you reduce that down to a single mass sailboat that has room for one person. And there's Mr. Jordan, lost at sea. But it gets worse. Not better, not yet. Because you see, his sailboat capsized. And there he was, sitting on top of his sailboat, smart enough when it capsized to have grabbed a whistle and put it around his neck. And he's sitting on top of the sailboat with a piece of fishing line so he could try to catch some fish and catching rainwater in his hat to drink rainwater to survive. And he's just out there bobbing in the ocean like a cork in water. In a little while, here comes a German freighter off the coast of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. And here comes that freighter, and he sees it off in a distance, and he takes his one good arm and starts waving it with everything he had, and he takes his whistle, and he blows his whistle for all that it's worth. And the ship continues on and he says oh all is lost but in that moment it slowly began to turn and come back Mr. Jordan said I knew if that ship didn't pick me up that all was lost that was my last chance 
That ship called Jesus is passing by right now for somebody present. Christ died for your sin. He was buried and God raised him from the dead and the ship called Jesus is passing by. And you need to pull out your whistle and you need to wave down the Lord Jesus and say, wait for me, rescue me. This is a moment I need you, Jesus, in my life now. And call on him. I tell you, he'll come speedily. He won't be slow to turn like those ships have to be. He'll come speedily. And as soon as you say that, he will come into your life and save you, won't he? Amen. Hallelujah. He'll do that. So I need you to bow your heads, if you would. and I need you to close your eyes. And I want to ask you, are you lost in that sea of humanity? Sitting on a capsized life, wondering how much longer you can hold on. If that's so, I've got good news. Because you see, Christ Jesus died. And Christ's death for your sins was heartily accepted by God. How do I know that? Because God raised them from the dead. And today you have a chance to repent and believe the good news that Jesus died for you. You have to receive Jesus by a conscious act of your will. It's called exercising faith. And I want you to do that. I want you to whisper these words to the Lord if you've not yet repented and believed on the Lord. Lord, I'm lost, and if you don't save me for Christ's sake, I'll die and be forever separated from you. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believed you raised Jesus from the dead and that Jesus Christ is my Lord. And by my own accord, I now declare that Jesus is Lord and he's my Savior. Please come into my heart. And if you'll pray that, I'm telling you God to hear you and save you. He'll do that for you. Lord God, I'm praying that you'll move on the hearts of men and women right now who need to make that commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is your invitation, Father. Some have believed but never been baptized. Some need to believe and then follow the Lord in baptism as a believer. Do you touch those lives and knock on their hearts now? Tell them you're calling them. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name.